gentlemen, good evening and welcome to this uh, third evening of the Wright Colloquium for Science for its 20th edition. Just as uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday, you're very numerous tonight. Uh, good evening to all of you who are listening online. I am uh, Julia, um, de Cibourg, Olivier de Cibourg. I am a scientific journalist, and I'll have the pleasure to be with you every evening this week. Uh, as every year, we are very privileged to welcome renowned speakers from the whole world. This uh, year is a little bit special because the organizers chose a more uh, a larger, a more original theme, the fi five elements. This uh, theme goes back to the antiquity, 460 before Christ, the four fundamental elements and the Empedocle philosopher who related those four elements to the Greeks. And then Aristotle added the notion of four quality, um, and the fifth element arrives a little bit later, and I, it will be life. Other fields uh, will take uh, these ideas, astrology, dietetics, uh, etc. So this is an allegory which will serve as a reference uh, rather than a formal framework to talk about uh, the different fields of geo sciences and to discover the research of uh, five renowned specialists of earth science. Uh, the evening will be split in two parts. Uh, the first one will consist of a conference, and the second one will be a session of uh, questions and answers. Uh, you are welcome to ask uh, your questions here or online. And you can do it in French as well as in English, because you received uh, uh, headsets for simultaneous interpretation. This evening, uh, we have uh, the immense pleasure of uh, studying the ocean with um, Ilke Fer, who's a professor at the Geophysical Institute in the University of Bergen in Norway. And I will give the floor to Thierry Courvoisier, who's the president of the Wright Foundation and who works at the Faculty of Sciences at the University of Geneva. Thank you. The university it doesn't have uh, an oceanography department. So I have uh, the role to present uh, Professor Ilkerfer tonight. The oceans are far from being more or less inert masses of water crossed by currents of simple geometry. The navigator is often surprised by movements contrary to what popular wisdom imagines. The Gulf Stream, for example, is not a linear river in the mil middle of the Atlantic, but a complex of movements and counter-movements. Understanding the nature of these movements is essential to know the part of the oceans and the physics of the whole planet. This is at the heart of the work of Professor Ilkerfer. Ilkerfer is uh, of Turkish origin. He's a professor in Bergen, Norway. He is a physicist and he specializes in the cold zones of the oceans, zones in which cold and dense water sink to the bottom causing the entire ocean circulation. But one shouldn't believe uh, that the oceans have uh, uh, the monopoly on the circulation of water of different physical properties. The Lake Geneva is also the scene of such movements. This is uh, so true that it is on the shores of Lake Geneva that Professor Fair obtained his PhD in 2001 under the supervision of Professor Ulrich Lemon of the EPFL with the work which became reference in this field. Ilker has made a brilliant career. He went on uh, expeditions in the Arctic, in the Barents Sea, and even drifted on polar ice during the winter. His research is deeply rooted in the harshest that na nature has to offer. It is absolutely essential to submit to these rigors to gain access to the knowledge of the oceans. 
the researcher then translates the realities that he has to live and measure into knowledge. Ilker is the author of numerous highly cited research papers, and he is the recipient of the prestigious Georg Wurst Prize for uh, his work on turbulences and mixing of ocean water. He's the member of uh, the Norwegian Academy for Polar Research among others. Norwegian universities are a rich scientific ground in which I had the great pleasure to share many fruitful moments. I am very happy about the contact that our university has with the university in Bergen, which the presence of Professor Ilker Fair represents. Thank you, Ilker, for being with us tonight. We look forward to hearing you. The floor is yours. Well, the uh, yeah, third element, the water, I will be talking about the ocean representing the water. Um, it's a pleasure for me to stand in front of you, talk about the ocean uh, in this prestigious venue offered by the Wright Foundation. And I'd like to extend my thanks for the organizer for inviting me. Uh, so uh, I will talk about the turbulent ocean, technological um, frontiers, new paradigms, and the emerging Arctic in particular. So I'm a physical oceanographer, so that's all about the ocean physics, how the waters move about, and how we, um, through interaction with the atmosphere, with, with forcing from the atmosphere, how we modify the properties of water. Our planet is covered more than 70% water, and the, the ocean offers more than 95% of the Earth's living space. So it's uh, very natural to call this planet ocean, as many refer to. Um, the ocean um, has been going through many changes recently, in the recent decades. A, a manifestation of that is the global surface temperature. This is the temperature anomalies relative to a 30-year baseline period from 1951 to 1980, showing the warming in the Earth's surface. Red colors are the warming, blue colors are the cooling. You can see that the, 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 it's dominated by red colors and increasingly so in the recent uh, years. And the last decades, the nature has been sending us messages again and again that something is happening. So each year has been a new record. I think 2021 tied up with 2018 as the sixth warmest in the last decade uh, for the global average ocean temperature, uh, so global surface temperature. So ocean um, provides our livelihoods, it provides us oxygen, food, medicine, and besides that, it also uh, sucks up carbon, carbon from the, from the atmosphere, it uh, takes up the heat and uh, maintains that, absorbs that, and keeps that, uh, thereby um, mitigating the pace of the climate change. So it's regulating the, the negative effects of the climate change in our planet system. So, uh, ocean regulates our climate by storing heat and carbon. Heat because the heat capacity of ocean is large. Like one meter of ocean, uh, it's corresponding to like 30 kilometers of atmosphere. So with that, the ocean takes the heat and maintains it long time in the deep ocean. Uh, I think uh, about 90% of the excess heat uh, induced by human activity since the Industrial Revolution was taken up by ocean. Carbon dioxide, about one-third of that was taken up. So ocean is doing us a huge service, but there's a but to it at expense of ocean warming, um, acidification, uh, deoxygenation, sea level rises, um, melting ice caps, towing permafrost, and, and more. Sea level rise, um, it's a global challenge and particularly problematic for um, coastal nations, uh, island nations, coastal communities, and, and also for well-developed economies. Uh, since the start of the observational period, starting from tide gorges, 
continuing with the satellite remote sensing measurements. We find that the, the global sea level has increased by 22 centimeters since late 1800s. Uh, and this is continuing to increase at an accelerating rate. So the, at the 90s, the trend was 3.5 millimeters per year. In the last decade, it's 4.6 millimeters per year. In other words, in 12 years or so, we'll add additional five centimeters to the sea level rise. So that happens uh, because of at least two reasons. Uh, one is the ocean warming. If you warm water, the molecules expand, occupy more volume. Uh, the other is the mass influx from melting land ice, glaciers, and ice sheets on Greenland and, and Antarctica. Of course, this has huge consequences for our climate system and also locally. There's a nice picture from Bergen, where we live. Uh, this is a, a, from Bryggen, looking to the fish market. Bryggen is a UNESCO national heritage um, a region, and this time after a um, storm surge, it's underwater. So the ice loss from Greenland is huge. Along the perimeters, we are talking about large masses lost, and that adds uh, into the water level. If the entire ice sheet of Greenland had melted, it corresponds to about seven meters. The melting reason, okay, we have the atmosphere, but also the warm waters approaching the, coming to the marine terminating glaciers, interaction and turbulent interaction leads to melting of those. I don't want to tell you how, how many meters additional sea level you get if you melt whole Antarctica, that's a lot, uh, but Antarctica is melting primarily on the um, Amundsen Sea, like the Pine Island Glacier, you, you see that on the map, on the red spot there, lots of mass loss happening. Oceans are all interconnected. We can see that nicely on this spillhouse projection of the ocean. Different basins of the Arctic, Atlantic, Indian, Pacific oceans around the Antarctic, they are all interconnected with the ocean circulation, moving about the waters and heat and carbon and dissolved gases. Uh, you can see the, uh, you, you can't see the 3D circulation or three-dimensional nature of it. Maybe in the next slide we can. So that's the idealized representation of the ocean circulation in three dimensions. The ocean currents are represented by these arrows. These are the slow moving wind driven typically currents. It's called the thermohaline circulation due to the changes in temperature for thermo and salinity, haline, which together determines the uh, density of the seawater. You can see the Gulf Stream coming to the northern latitudes and taking around, and uh, this warm water is responsible for the relatively warm climate in the northern Europe, and it keeps the waters around Iceland and Greenland ice-free um, year-round. So this water, as it travels around the basin there, it interacts with the atmosphere, loses lots of heat, gets denser, and sinks to the bottom. When it's at the bottom, it, these dense waters then circulate southward. That's the global overturning circulation. So the, the vertical structure is of huge importance, although the aspect ratio of the ocean is like a sheet of paper. Um, so these waters circulate to the equatorial regions, and there they have to upwell. That's, uh, they have to rise to the surface again. So one water parcel starting from the surface, sinking down and getting back to the surface, it takes about 1,000 years. But that's how we can um, mitigate the climate change in a way, restore, uh, the storing the carbon and the heat in the ocean. If you go farther south, at about 60 degrees south, uh, the waters around Antarctica, there's no obstacle for the, for the motion of the, of the, of the ocean. So the currents can travel all, all the way around. And this allows the waters to upwell in the Pacific Ocean and the, the Indian Ocean. Uh, another uh, important aspect of the Antarctic regions is the dense water production. The very dense waters produced in the Weddell Sea and in different regions sink all the way to the abyss of the ocean and start filling from there. Well, the ocean circulation is not so simple as like um, straight lines and arrows. As Thierry mentioned, the Gulf Stream, all this variability. So there are 
There are lots of uh, activity, um, like the swirls of motion, the, the weather of the ocean, uh, that is not represented in this picture. So, uh, we have to understand those processes because our understanding of the um, climate, the, the, the climate comes from our ability to model these processes. And the way we do that is we uh, believe in the laws of physics, thermodynamics. We have those equations and we grid the ocean and we apply the equations and solve on supercomputers. So each of these boxes are one-tenth of a degree longitude latitude. That's about 10 kilometers. So we are talking about a 10 kilometer box um, on which uh, you have no information what's inside. All the weather of the ocean and the turbulence that I'll come back later happens within. So we have to understand those properly so we can represent them in, in such models when we solve the equations. That's an example of what's going on when you model at this coarse resolution. That's fairly high resolution for a global model. You can see the Gulf Stream meandering and the swirling eddies, the warm waters of the, uh, coming from the Florida current and then interacting with the cold waters from the Labrador current. All this variability. So there's a unit uh, for the volume flow uh, in oceanography. That's called one swear drop. That's one million cubic centimeters per second. That's named after the famous Norwegian oceanographer, Harald Sverdrup, who was the former uh, director of the, Swiss, uh, the Scripps uh, Institution of Oceanography. So the average flow rate of this current is about 30 to 50 Sverdrups. One Sverdrup equals to the, all rivers combined flowing out to the ocean is about one Sverdrup. As we approach the equator, um, the, the size of the swirls get larger because of the planetary constraints. Um, but th the pulsing and all the action going on in this uh, simulation shows you how dynamic the ocean is. It took quite a long time to, to get there. Um, we didn't know the ocean was so dynamic. Back in the day, only one human life ago, they, they, they were thinking the ocean was quite uh, stagnant at deep waters. It's quite quiescent, nothing going on. So that's the Challenger in Southern Ocean, a four-year expedition in 1872. That laid the foundations for oceanography, collecting data on ocean currents, temperature, uh, geology, and chemistry. So uh, still then, um, expeditions continued, but it, it was to the stage that if you deploy your device at the same location, again, it was considered like a waste of money or resources. You don't want to collect more data, nothing going on. And it was all simplified. And ships have been the main um, means of collecting data for many years to come. But observations were mainly coarse. Typically, multiple 10 kilometers separation between the stations. So these lacked uh, complex interactions of the ocean we just looked at. So if you look at the global scale, you have the large scale currents. These become unstable. They shed eddies, swirls, expel those, and then um, they interact with each other. These eddies can be between 10, 100 kilometer scale. And interacting through them, they, they lead to mesoscale uh, phenomena, like filaments, say from kilometer scale to hundreds of meter scale. And then farther, you go down to sub-mesoscale and then small-scale turbulence at the order centimeters. So you have to resolve all these interactions, all this spectrum of uh, scales to, to, to properly represent what's going on in the ocean. In the recent decades, there's been huge developments. So typically, research vessels uh, equipped with modern instrumentation, devices to measure the structure, temperature, salinity structure of the ocean, and the horizontal currents have been used to enhance our knowledge of the ocean. Uh, satellite remote sensing, satellites equipped with active or passive sensors like uh, uh, radiometers or uh, radar altimeters, they allowed us to map the ocean surface for sea surface temperature the topography of the ocean, all this activity, ocean weather leads to sea surface variability that you can detect from remote sensing. 
or the sea ice extent or the ocean color that represents the biology. Then um, the invent of the microstructure profilers, these are instruments specifically designed to measure ocean turbulence, have opened up a new perspective where we started collecting data on ocean turbulence. Um, maybe most recently the ocean robots have uh, made huge progress. They, are, they have become a, a mature technology. Uh, some are propelled uh, assets like the autonomous underwater vehicle, like this one from Kongsberg, the red unit in the middle. Or they can be ocean gliders, gliding in the water column up and down with their own buoyancy, um, collecting data throughout. Or they can be an Argo float. An Argo float is a robotic device. It's designed to be expandable. After five years or so, when battery dies, it's over. So it's ballasted for a target depth of, say, 1,000 meters. You deploy this device, it sinks to 1,000 meters, not collecting any data, just drifting there for 10 days. Then, using its buoyancy pump, it sinks to about 2,000 or 6,000 meters. On the way up, it collects data on essential ocean variables. It can be temperature, salinity, or even bio biogeochemistry, like dissolved oxygen. And between this 10 days period, between the surfacing locations, we can get an estimate of the surface current, uh, of the deep current. Um, Argo is an international program contributing to the uh, global ocean observing system. Now at a given month, we have more than 300, uh, 3,000 3, operational Argo floats, giving this exemplary coverage of the world ocean. Um, providing maybe 400 profiles a day. With this information, then, we can accurately um, calculate the heat content of the ocean. We have the data we need to do that. An ocean glider, on, in contrast to um, a float, it just glides with its points up and down in a soft tooth pattern. It's a remotely piloted asset. Uh, you can give it some coordinates. Uh, when the instrument comes to the surface, you, you can send the new waypoint, and you download the data. It's accessible in your computer right away. They can live for um, uh, months to a year-long missions, providing data no matter what weather condition or sea state. That's one big advantage of the ocean gliders. Another advantage is that this data being sent through a satellite it's then uh, harvested by the operational sense, uh, centers. They can use this data, assimilate in their weather forecasting models on the fly. Every day they can adjust their models with proper data coming out. Argo floats, ocean gliders, contributes to a better operational system, better weather forecasts. So with all these um, tools we have available, we can map the heat content in the ocean. This is the heat content graph for the Earth system, split into atmosphere, ice and ground, and ocean. Ocean by far absorbed the most heat, by 90% since 1960. Uh, the unit here is a zeta joule. That's a joule with 21 zeros after. So it's lots of heat we are talking about. But if you look at the vertical distribution, just take the ocean heat and look how it is in the vertical. The upper 300 meters is only 40% of the total heat content. So amazingly, there's lots of heat going on all the way to the ocean bottom. We can understand how all this radiation is absorbed in the upper ocean. That's where the heat comes in, that will be there. But how do you bring it all the way down to, to 6,000 meters? So the eddies we looked at, uh, the ocean weather that distributes heat laterally, but vertical mixing, turbulence, it distributes vertically. So to get these right, you have to get the turbulent mixing in the ocean properly. Um, just for your reference, this large number of uh, energy in the heat budget, it corresponds to about um, 60 watts light bulb heating 100 Olympic swimming pools, if my calculation is correct. So we are talking about a very small um, uh, energy here but has huge consequences like the global warming, the climate change. So we, we have to get this small number right. 
Turbulent mixing redistributes the heat vertically. And that will be the main topic of my, for the remainder of my talk. So you say, what is turbulence? You are used to turbulence from normal day, every day. Um, in Steve's talk, we had this uh, outburst of uh, eruptions of volcano. It's uh, buoyant plumes rising up, and you can have a cigarette smoke uh, getting mixed with the ambient. Lots of examples of turbulence. So if you don't have turbulence, a patch of red water here uh, in this white environment will diffuse by itself, by molecular diffusion. It will take some time. But if you stir it, if you put energy into it, like you put sugar in your tea and then you stir it with a spoon, it will mix much quicker. That's the turbulent mixing. At rates much larger than the molecular rates. If you don't supply your energy into that, it will die out. But the ocean needs energy all the time because you have to maintain the circulation and turbulence is at the heart of this circulation. So what is providing this energy? Turbulent mixing in the ocean is fueled by wind and tides. So you can see the surface waves at the, at the ocean breaking, generating turbulence is visible to you. Just like that in the interior ocean we have waves. Ocean is layered, stratified. Between each layer you can have waves. And they are much larger, tens of meters in amplitude, and much slower in time scale, hours. But when they break, they are turbulent, they fuel the energy. So you can generate these waves from top by the winds, or you can generate them by tides sloshing back and forth over topography. In Lake Geneva here, we don't have tides. But tides is an important component in the global ocean um, turbulence budget. So these energy scales are the, the, the scales by interacting through different wave packets, cascade down to smaller scales, and finally to turbulent mixing at centimeter scale. So for the rest of my talk, I'll give you some examples from some of our research on, in the Norwegian Sea, and then higher north in the Arctic Ocean. So Nordic Seas is the name, common name for the Greenland, Norwegian, and Iceland Sea. It's the heart of the global overturning circulation this large-scale ocean uh, circulation. So you see two branches of warm water, the North Atlantic Current, carrying warm waters into our latitudes in Norway. So that's responsible for the warm climate over there. Um, you see one uh, going over the Moan Ridge, so that's the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that's uh, steering the currents, another arm following the slope of, the, of Norway. And these carry on to, into the Arctic Ocean. Uh, in Fram Strait, between Greenland and Svalbard on the north, they make a turn um, and circulate back along Greenland. So in this circulation, they lose lots of heat. They get denser and sink to deeper levels, and they flow out to, to be this uh, loop, um, the northern limb of this uh, overturning circulation. The channels and like between Faroes and Shetland and the Denmark Strait between Iceland and Greenland are the main passages for these deep waters to come to North Atlantic. In the Norwegian Sea, a Lofoten Basin sticks out, it stands out. It's the basin between the two branches of this Atl uh, Atlantic water current. If you look at the heat content, it's warm. The heat is distributed laterally and also vertically. Heat content is nothing but integrated temperature. Um, so um, if you look at the surface topography from satellite data, altimetry data, we also see that it's highly energetic. Lots of eddies and swirls going around. So this energy, which we call the eddy kinetic energy, averaged over some time, looks like this. Uh, you have like a red spot in the middle of the basin. That's we've discovered that that's the Lofoten Basin Eddy. That's a vortex, semi-permanent. It's always there. So the, the boundary current gets unstable and sheds those swirls of vortices going into the basin and collected in the basin uh, within this uh, vortex. This is uh, important for fisheries. You have lots of blooms. Uh, this is an example from the satellite uh, image showing the chlorophyll A distribution and have lots of small mesoscale activity, uh, which you can see in a um, parameter that shows the 
swirling strength of the, of the water column relative to Earth's rotation. It's lots of, lots of um, uh, structure there. So we had a project done. We wanted to study this uh, vortex in the basin and understand the dynamics of that. So what is that, you say, spaghetti looking like uh, lines with some sticks going on? These are transects or the missions from four gliders, ocean gliders, collecting data for us. They've been out there collecting thousands of profiles for two years, working its way through the basin into, the, into this vortex, spiraling in and out, and lots of ensembles you put together and get a nice picture of the dynamics, what's going on in that eddy. And also over the Mon Ridge at the front between cold Greenland waters and the warm Norwegian sea waters. What's going on there? The good thing about this is that you get data no matter what uh, sea state or uh, weather conditions. When you're out there with a the research vessel, you have to interrupt the sampling because it's bad weather. Like, like in here, that's uh, from a cruise in March, then we couldn't collect any data. So there comes the strength of the ocean robots, like those gliders that collect data and help us to, to sample no matter what condition. Uh, we, so we didn't only have gliders, but we also had some floats that we could acoustically track. That you deploy something ballasted for certain depth, uh, say 500 meters, and you can track that by acoustic triangulation where it is. So we had a bunch of those. There, this is a movie showing all the assets put together, uh, synthesizing that to show you the coherence of this vortex, what's, what's going on. You can see the ship coming in and out, the floats being trapped at this virtual boundary of the vortex, uh, and the glider coming in and out of this uh, vortex, spiraling in and out occasionally. So you can see that most of those floats are trapped inside this eddy, uh, of this vortex, just wo wobbling around in the basin. The, the diameter is about 30 kilometers, that uh, circle over there. Some of the floats that are relatively shallow, like 250 meters, they escape. They, because near the surface layer, you can um, uh, remove some of the dynamical constraints, barriers uh, induced by the rotational effects but through ARC interaction. So it was crucial for us to collect all this detailed data to understand the physics of, of what's going on here. But it's a very coherent structure lasting for a long time. So then you have your ship going into the, into the vortex. So we occupy different stations starting from the outside of the eddy, um, collecting profiles and putting those together. That gives you a snapshot of the across this vortex. Because it's a circular structure, it's enough to cover just half of this. Uh, you can see that, so that's the temperature we are looking at, uh, measured by this uh, frame equipped with devices to measure the temperature, salinity, and the ocean currents. Uh, you see, say, 1,000 meters depth, away from the core, away from the center of the vortex, there are cold waters, blue colors. In the core, it's trapped warm waters all the way down to 1,200 meters. It's the same for the salinity. This is the salinity di diagram. So you see that the, the red colors are higher numbers for higher values for the salinity. Um, if you now, those who claim that the ocean was quiet at depth, nothing going on, look at that one. So that's the swirl velocity of this vortex. We are looking at the in meters per second, it's like a river flow, up to one meter per second, uh, at 1,000 meters depth. That's at the base of this vortex, you have so large currents and strong shear, it's highly turbulent. So that has consequences for the life cycle of this vortex and also for the biology. Um, we can measure the turbulence with this dedicated device. It measures all the small scale fluctuations. Um, if you look at this 1,200 meter region at the base of the eddy, there are very large numbers of a parameter called dissipation rate, epsilon. That's the, a proxy for the turbulence intensity. And the scale is logarithmic. Each jump is 
factor of 10, 10 times, 100 times larger than the background levels. For reference, the numbers at uh, this red band, um, they are comparable to surface turbulence in under uh, strong wind conditions. I think it was a cool discovery to, to get all this. Um, so I'd like to move uh, farther north into Arctic Ocean. Arctic is the canary in a coal mine. Why is that? Because it's the polar amplification, the Arctic amplification. The warming rates in the Arctic Ocean is at least twice as large as the global average. Here you see the surface temperature um, reaching up to four degrees in the Arctic regions. Um, that's because of mainly the albedo effect, the reflectivity effect, the uh, Arctic Ocean. By the way, Arctic Ocean is an ocean, so it's not land. It's, uh, you have 4,000 meters of water under sea ice. Sea ice can be a few meters thick, and it's under constant motion. It's just moving with the tides, with the currents, with winds. So if you remove the ice, then you expose the surface its darker surface, uh, the water, it will absorb more heat from the radiation. So if you remove sea ice, then you um, let the ocean absorb more heat. Uh, as a result of that, or chicken and the egg problem, the, the Arctic sea ice volume is shrinking. So this uh, animation showing the huge changes in the sea ice volume. Not only the horizontal extent is shrinking, but also the thickness. Multi-year ice, that's sea ice that survived at least one summer, uh, they, they are very limited now. You used to have five-year-old ice. I think it's uh, less than 95% has disappeared. So where does this heat come to? What's the reason um, of this melting of sea ice? Of course, atmosphere is the huge player, but we can't ignore the ocean. I'd like to advocate, uh, maybe hopefully convince you that the ocean is important and ocean turbulence is very important. Heat comes to the Arctic Ocean from two gateways. One is the you know, Fram Strait and the Barents Sea, this red Atlantic water inflow coming in. And another gateway is Bering Strait from the Pacific Ocean. This heat then circulates in the Arctic Ocean. And if there is sufficient heat in the Arctic Ocean to melt the sea ice several times over, but these warm waters are subsurface. They are submerged under very cold waters. But changes are happening in the Arctic. With the changing arc, uh, I, I can mention the Atlantification. That's a word for that Atlantic water reaches higher up, and there's more of that in the Arctic. There is declining sea ice, leading to stronger seasonal cycle. Sea ice, uh, kind of, you have a summer minimum and a winter maximum, that's the seasonal cycle, it's strengthened. That can lead to more uh, wind energy input from the winds that can fuel more turbulence and more vertical mixing. So this loss of sea ice, what you need is only one watts per square meter perturbation to account for that. One watts per square meter is a very small number. That's what's happening now, that we are losing all this sea ice. Atmosphere can account for, of course, much, but the ocean has a zoo of processes that can account for that. For example, this warm Atlantic water, the red uh, parts of this uh, cartoon, it goes over very um, tidal mixing regions. Then you can extract this heat all the way to the sea ice. Then the eddies stir horizontally and distribute this heat. Um, you have uh, all the internal wave field in the interior that alone accounts for maybe one watts per square meter uh, background mixing. And also you have a peculiar structure of the Arctic Ocean, um, which results in this uh, staircases where the temperature is uh, increasing like a staircase. That's a, that's a particular effect that can account for like one watts per square meter. If you look at the Arctic Ocean profile, so you, are, you see the red temperature, black the salinity under sea ice. Freezing point temperatures down to 100 meters. That's in the central Arctic Ocean, okay? Um, and even though it's at freezing point, 
starting at about 50-ish meters, you have this gradient in salinity. That's the stratification that caps, caps this uh, warm water from below. So you have the cold mixed layer and strong salinity stratification, and you have the warm Atlantic water. If you have the ability to mix the seed upward, then you can melt the ice. That's a dangerous scenario, but it can happen if you remove the sea ice, so you bring in more wind energy that can fuel turbulence. But this cold layer with salinity, called the cold halocline layer, kind of caps this. There's a nice picture of a polar bear um, swimming in open waters, but I'm sure she appreciates more uh, living on sea ice. This was from a cruise we did last uh, this summer. So with this motivation, what's the role of the Arctic Ocean heat for the sea ice cover? I staged several experiments starting with the International Polar Year in 2007. Then we went to this um, ice camp near the North Pole called Barneo, and there make a hole in the ice. Again, you have 4,000 meters of water ocean underneath, over two meters thick ice. So we deployed our instruments and collected data on ocean turbulence, temperature, salinity, and currents. We learned a lot from those. It's similar temperature salinity structure on the left panel here. Um, the diagrams are technical because it's just taken from scientific research papers. Ignore that. The black shaded um, curve is the dissipation rate of uh, turbulence. That's the turbulent uh, proxy we talked about. The larger numbers, the more turbulence. So we see those background mixing at the bottom below 200 meters. That's because of internal wave breaking. But what we see at the top, reaching as deep as 100 meters, is the energetic turbulence from wind force internal waves. So we, we managed to describe that thanks to this uh, data we, we were able to co collect. We also found out that this stratification of salinity in the upper layer makes it impossible to mix across the, the barrier. But again, if you energize the internal wave field, you can remove that. So that can be a bad feedback for the sea ice. From the Pacific side, okay, we were at the Central Ocean, Arctic. Now let's go to the Pacific. Our colleagues from the scripts, they identify those heat bombs destroying the Arctic sea ice. So these warm, salty pockets of water, they are expelled from the boundary current, the jets along the Alaskan coast. And this warm water can dive underneath the sea ice. And as it do does so, it mixes with the ambient water and the waters from below, drawing in nutrients, which is essential for the biology. And then uh, these start swirling and trap the waters, trap the heat for many months, maybe years, and they propagate into the interior of the ocean, of the Arctic Ocean. So this is a means by which you can extract heat from a boundary current and push it all the way to the central or Arctic and remove the heat, uh, remove the sea ice. What's happening on the Atlantic side? So Atlantic side is more energetic. There's more heat, more action. We didn't call it heat bombs yet, but uh, it's lots more going on in terms of heat transfer. So in 2015, we had this Norwegian young sea ice expedition where we froze a research vessel into sea ice and drifted with sea ice. Everybody jumped on ice and collect data. Um, north of Svalbard, drifting uh, with the ocean currents, with the sea ice, again and again for up from winter time to summer time. We collected lots of data. We synthesized all that together. What we learned was if the Atlantic water, that's the subsurface warm water, is close to sea ice, if that's close to topography where tides are acting energetically, and if you have storm events, you can extract as much as 100, 100 watts per square meter to melt sea ice. Remember, you only needed one watt per square meter, so such events can have importance on the large scale. Another thing we learned, we, we also deploy, um, ha, had deployed some instruments just under the sea ice, the boundary layer below the sea ice, collecting data, also in winter time. 
So in Arctic winter, it's all dark. There's no radiation forcing. So only heat source is the ocean. So we thought if we can quantify the, arc, the contribution of, of ocean in winter, that's it. We, have, we know how much it's coming up. So look at the black and uh, gray kind of uh, part of this histogram of heat fluxes going from 0 to 15 watts per square meter. So in winter time, in quiet conditions, calm, no winds, no nothing, you get about 1 watts per square meter um, oceanic heat flux to ice. And in storms, that's doubled. So that's a huge uh, input during winter time, and there's no other source of um, heat. A major undertaking recently was this mosaic, multidisciplinary drifting observatory for the study of Arctic climate, using the research icebreaker Polar Stern, the German icebreaker, as a platform. So this was there for one year, collecting data for entire, entire annual cycle. The plan was then drift from the Laptev Sea, high north, through the Fram Strait out. And the drift was faster than planned, so the, the vehicle, um, the, the vessel came out of sea ice in June, July, and then we had to go back to, to north, near North Pole and freeze, start drifting again. But we, different disciplines, atmosphere, cryosphere, sea ice, ocean, collected huge amounts of data, ecosystem, biology, biogeochemistry. Um, so th there are workshops, conferences, just work going through this data. Um, I'd like to emphasize or highlight just one thing I was involved in. That was, uh, you know, I can't go through this whole mosaic expedition, but we had a specially designed instrument that's an upriser microstructure profiler. So that's a buoyant instrument that will rise, that, that wants to float. So we forced this instrument by weight down to 50, 60 meters, and then we release the weight, and that will rise with its buoyancy. By doing so, it collects data until it hits the ice. We were not afraid of hitting the ice because it has those protections on the sensors. So again and again, we profiled with this. So resolving the turbulent structure under drifting sea ice. So the sea ice is moving a lot. Uh, along this drift of the mosaic frozen into the sea ice. We had about 200 profiles in different conditions, different basins, different wind drift strength, um, and also in leads, and also maybe close to ridges. So the sea ice is not flat. All the pressure, the ice is in constant motion. All this pressure acts to generate ridges, maybe a few meters tall at the surface, but that's the tip of the iceberg. Below that, you have maybe eight, 10 meters of a keel. So that means a lot for the boundary layer on the ice, how much you can extract heat from the warm layer below. So we did uh, lots of analysis. Um, so you see here, by the way, the different images of how it looks like in June, and later in September when um, you have lots of melt ponds at, uh, at this ice surface. So we went out with a zodiac, for example, collected data um, from holes in the ice, and lots of details. This is a picture showing the elevation of ice at the surface and the draft, how the ice, what the ice thickness is below. You can see the red colors reaching eight meters. And for those who haven't seen any sea ice before, it's not flat, it looks like this. And you can have lot, lots of melt ponds, the melt snow, um, uh, making life difficult to navigate from point A to point B. Anyways. These are very exciting for me, so probably not for you. But uh, what we learned on the pack ice, pack ice is um, no cracks, nothing, um, drifting pack ice, the turbulence in the upper 20 meter increased markedly for high drift speeds. Because you, you drag waters, you have friction, you have turbulence generation in the upper 20 meters. In leads, so leads are the cracks between ice flows. In leads, you have strong interaction, large interaction with the atmosphere. So you can, have, you can lose heat or wind can force turbulence. The upper two meters in the leads was 10 times more energetic than in, in, um, in thin ice compared to thin ice. 
So this, so this kind of data allowed us um, to categorize a bit more, understand a bit more. It's still uh, early days, baby steps, but we are getting there. And such technology is allowing us to collect good data. Rich keels, five, eight meters thick uh, extension of the sea ice was generating lots of turbulence. Final process, so I'm trying to give you some different flavors of what's going on, like mixing processes in the Arctic Ocean. This is the final one that goes into the parameters, what's going on, and that's about the tides. Tides, when they work on topography, like I mentioned before, they can generate some phenomena that can lead to turbulent mixing. The story in the Arctic Ocean is a bit complicated, it's not linear. We find out recently, using some detailed data, that the pathway of energy from tides to turbulent mixing was highly nonlinear. That means that uh, it's difficult. Um, so there's a bunch of parameters I'm not going to explain, but if you look at the map, you see that there are some bright green colors where the tidal velocity maximum heading on slope onto the, onto the topography can be as large as one meter per second. That has a large significance for the, for the internal tide-induced mixing. So what's happening here? Uh, if you imagine two layers, one the surface, the other one is the thermocline or the pycnocline where you have the stratification, um, uh, and you have topography. So when the tide pushes the water over the, over the sill, over this topography, it depresses the term of this surface and like a um, Lee wave, what we call. And so that wave wants to propagate, wants to leave that site toward where it was generated. But the ocean current, the tidal current, is so strong that it traps it. The wave can't go anywhere, so it's trapped. But during slack tide, when the tide relaxes, the wave is free to propagate, but it's not trapped anymore. And with the flood tide uh, away from the topography, then it's getting steeper, and the pockets of, um, or trains of waves develop which are steep and they can break and lead to turbulence. That's all textbook material, but we actually observe that. Observe that. North of Svalbard, one transect we are looking at here, starting from um, off uh, 100 kilometers going in towards shore. We occupy these stations collecting turbulence data. Okay, the colors here are a representation of turbulence. Bright red is very turbulent. At this 300 meter isobot depth, uh, the entire water column is turbulent. Large numbers, 10 to the minus six, that's uh, under a storm level of turbulence. The inset there, it shows you the crests of waves that are seen by the satellite, so, uh, SAR imagery. Um, because internal waves have a roughness uh, signature at the surface, you can detect those uh, with satellite images. So at this uh, star, we put uh, there by the 300 meters depth, you can see a bunch of small waves being generated and propagating. So we said, okay, let's go there and be there for 24 hours, repeatedly collecting data. The team was not happy but we collected a, a nice time series of turbulence profiles showing this entire 300 meter, it's a, I don't know how long the Eiffel Tower is, but it's, it's, it's tall. Uh, the entire water column is turbulent and consistent with this textbook theory of what, what may be going on. And we claim that that's quite common in the Arctic Ocean. So it's a new paradigm that can, or showing the roots pathway of energy to turbulent mixing. It can be as large as 100 watts per square meter. You probably now forgot how much we needed, but uh, on average we need one watts per square meter to melt the sea ice. So, I, I probably spoke like two hours, I don't know, but this is my final slide. So, we, uh, our ability to predict what's going on has increased substantially. We are learning a lot with this new technology. And we live in exciting times. It's uh, exciting to have all this technology that we can collect uh, good data and make major advances. With this, I'd like to thank you all for your patience. And um, I'd like to round up with a quote from Doug Webb, the um, founder of the Teledyne Web Research and uh, inventor of the Slocum uh, 
a glider that work hard, have fun, and change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Please uh, take a seat. As you all know, this is uh, what's interesting about this uh, colloquium. We have several uh, speakers all uh, along the week, and we've decided to invite all of them on the stage to discuss and debate. And so I will uh, invite on the stage Kim Prather from uh, San Diego, uh, Richard van Vanbergeborg, and Nick uh, Lane also. So uh, I'll switch to, to English and, and start maybe with a, a, a five-minute discussion, then uh, I'll open the floor to, to questions. And maybe before we start with the, uh, the other guests, uh, two precision questions to you, uh, Ilker. Um, the first is related to your last slide, actually. Uh, we saw how detailed you go in the observation of the ocean, but at the same time, the ocean is so big and so complex that I'd like to ask you, on a scale of 0 to 10, <laughs> how much, how, how high would you rate your uh, good understanding of what we know or don't know of the ocean and, and how to go higher? Yeah, I think it's key to increase our process understanding. Between 0 and 10? <laughs> <laughs> how high we need to yeah. go? <laughs> oh, oh. 7 is good enough, I seven? guess. 7? Okay. <laughs> But I think it's key to emphasize that these process studies, you study the process, uh, you learn from that, and then that can be applicable globally or where it happens. So that's the goal, the, to do process studies. You don't need to do it everywhere, but you do that and learn from it and improve your understanding of it. We have to uh, increase that maybe to 10, just to process it. So you say you will learn I'd like to ask you, uh, our three guests, how far is what you've just uh, listened to now useful to your field of competence, uh, to your research uh, uh, on the ground? Maybe starting with you, uh, uh, Friedhelm. Uh, we've heard from you on Monday that um, you're studying this thermostat that is uh, governed, if I can say that, by the CO2 emitted by the volcanoes and also absorbed by the rocks. Uh, but how far are the oceans interesting or useful for you? How is this research, how could this research be useful for your research as well? Um, well, first of all, um, I, I used to do related studies myself, uh, but, but like a few years ago when, because the isotopes that I use, we can use those just, just in the same way to, to track ocean circulation, both in the present and, and now. So the topic is a bit familiar to me in that regard. However, but your question, how does, this, how does the regulation of Earth's climate, how is the ocean linked to it? It's, it's, it's linked to it in a big way because the ocean takes up the, the CO2 that is, that is removed uh, from the atmosphere and this is where eventually it goes and the time scales over which this removal mechanism happens is linked to, to ocean circulation and ocean circulation is also linked to chemical processes in the oceans, namely the depth at which calcite can form. So, so this, is, this is all highly, uh, highly relevant. And there, there's another process, and this is uh, biological. The ocean circulation also helps to bring micronutrients into the midst of the oceans, which then helps phytoplankton growth, which again sequesters more carbon. So this is all linked very closely. Nick, same question. So we'll hear about you uh, and your research on Friday uh, uh, on the origins of life. Uh, well, I'm sure it is linked very closely, but it's very difficult. Um, I suppose what I get from this is just how complex this system is now and how little we understood about it until very recently. And what I am trying to do is understand the role of the oceans four billion years ago in deep sea hydrothermal vents. Um, now, I, I think not everybody agrees. Some people think that life started on land in, in Darwin's warm pond. I think it started in the oceans. Convection currents and so on are almost certainly absolutely central to, 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 to the mixing, but also the, um, 
the moon was a lot closer. There was probably a lot more turbulence. There was probably much less land. I have no idea how these patterns... I mean, I, I, was, I was very struck how sensitive they are to the presence of land and the shape of the land and so on. And, um, so, so if there's much less land, I have no idea really from this what that means for uh, the, the actual currents and so on. The other thing which is very difficult to constrain is the salinity of the early oceans. Um, pr probably the best guess is it was similar to today, but again, the salinity, a, a lot of the, the temperatures and the salinity seem to matter a great deal in terms of the mixing and, or, or the failure to mix and the, and the turbulence. Um, so I suppose I'm saying I, d I don't know. These are all themes that are almost certainly extremely important for what I'm working on, but it's very difficult for me to go from the present day I, I, I savor the complexity of the present day, but how I can extrapolate that backwards to four billion years ago, I have to say, I, I, I don't have a clear idea. <laughs> well, maybe, Kim, you do, because you also work on oceans, and uh, we'll hear about you and your research tomorrow on the aerosol. Um, please. Yeah, I mean, it's very relevant. Uh, I mean, the ocean and the atmosphere talk to each other all the time. And um, one of the issues is that we need to work together more. Um, you know, basically the ocean, the circulation patterns in the ocean, I've come to appreciate, um, and how they're changing is, are actually changing the atmospheric flow patterns as well. And um, I, that's a surprise to most people that the flow of the ocean can control the atmosphere. The other thing the ocean does, as I will talk more about tomorrow, and the turbulence is very interested, interesting to me because, um, you know, the ocean emits mini aerosols, which I study, um, which seed clouds, which have a huge effect on climate. The ocean also, through turbulence, emits a lot of gases, just like a forest. And so, again, cloud seeds and climate um, and atmospheric composition is really, really strongly controlled by the ocean. So I'm, I'm very fascinated. I work with oceanographers all the time, and you'll hear more tomorrow about how we're trying to link the two together more and more. So uh, I'll go for one additional question to you, Ilke, but also to, to the three of you. You might know that the, the decade 21 to 30, to, so 2021 to 2030, has been named by the UN uh, the decade for the ocean. And the vision for that decade uh, is such, the science we need for the ocean we want. So what is the science we need? What is your biggest wish for the, the science of the oceans that we need for the ocean we want to have? Maybe. Start with Elker and then the others. Yeah, th th that's two different questions, what we need and what we want. Yeah? So, of course, I'm passionate about the things I want, but I can't claim that that's really what we need. I know they are useful, like the ocean mixing and turbulence. I hope I convinced you that that, that matters. <laughs> so I'd like to do more research, expect more research to get a global coverage of uh, good ocean mixing studies and have more interdisciplinary studies in relation to air-sea interactions, so atmosphere and ocean talk to each other, and also the links to ecosystem. How all this term mixing, um, what, what does it mean for the uh, interactions with the biology and all this nutrient, how that's distributed with all these turbulence? So we have to have interdisciplinary studies, I think. Comments? Yeah, I, would, I just second everything that he said. I think that the, the really, the future is all about the integration be, across the disciplines of the biology and the physics and the chemistry and the atmosphere and the oceans and the land. They all, they all talk. And so we've, we've spent a lot of time understanding each one of our, I call them compartments in the environment. We are all, we're all talking about different compartments this week, but I think integrating them is absolutely key. I, I agree with that. Any, any comment? Otherwise, I propose to open the floor for questions. So again, uh, you can ask your questions both in, in English and French, and there'll be simulta uh, simultaneous translation for the, for the guests on stage. And also, for those of you following up uh, online, you can ask your question by writing in the, in the chat system of the live stream, and they will be relayed. Actually, we already have one question from the online audience. We have one technical question, uh, which is, you, you have uh, highlighted uh, the data side of your research, and somebody is asking uh, how much uh, computing power plays a role in, in what you're doing. 
computing role, I, I guess you are referring to like how to do this numerically. Uh, because computing power for analyzing my data, <laughs> you don't need that much. But uh, to model turbulence, uh, uh, you have to do direct numerical simulations, technically that's what it's called. And that, then we are talking about a tank in a, <laughs> like a, a small tank of water. Um, so then you can learn all about, you don't need to parameterize anything, you can learn all about it. And that requires already supercomputers. I'm not a modeler, I don't want to say wrong things, but the next step is the large eddy simulation. Then you resolve quite a lot, the larger eddies, but you don't get all the tiny bits of the turbulence. Then you can represent the oceanic fronts, a bit larger structures, order kilometer, I think. Still using supercomputers. Yeah. So you need a substantial computational power. You can't get anywhere close uh, in regional models or global models. There's a, a, a second question which relates to actually uh, some of the things we've heard, and, and that is to know how much volcanic activity in the oceans plays a role in the circulation and in the turbulence. Oh, that's a tough one. Nice question. So I think volcanic activity plays a huge role uh, in local, so locally, local turbulence but probably not so in the integrated sense, in the global sense. Um, I know, for example, the, like the ge geothermal heating on global average is only 0 0.05 watts per square meter, so very negligible uh, um, net flux from that. But um, what, what was the second part of the question? The, the, the question was to know whether this volcanic activity influences also the turbulence and whether that can have a, a macroscopic effect. I don't know. Good, good my, to hear my, that sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I so. yeah. Might I ask a question myself that kind of r relates to that um, because I'm thinking about the end Permian extinction um, where the Siberian traps were flowing lava across large areas, and it's linked with global warming. Uh, I don't know how strong, it's not what I work on, but I don't, so I don't know how strong these ideas are, but the ocean's becoming anoxic, becoming sulfidic, so saturated with hydrogen sulfide, um, and, and a mass extinction, this, this, the largest mass extinction in the history of the Earth. Uh, and, and I have the feeling, but I don't know if this is really true, that the, um, the warmer the oceans, um, the, the less you have the, the mixing and the, and the currents in, in, in the way. I, I certainly had that impression from some of your images. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I guess if you, if you don't have turbulent mixing for some reason, <laughs> uh, you, you come to a stage that you, you just keep on filling the basin from the bottom with cold water, and you have the radiation from the top, and you end up with a very thin layer of very warm water and a very strong stratification uh, funny, funny ocean, uh, uh, unnatural. But probably in the old days, uh, many, many, many years ago, that uh, the tides were so different and the water levels so different that uh, you could still force some uh, tidal induced mixing and generate the, the power you need to maintain some circulation. But these are all dark ages for me, so, sorry. <laughs> are there questions in the audience? Did I see a, a question there? No? <laughs> That's not the case. So I have ma many questions, actually. You have a question. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, OK. So how do we, how good, how well do we actually know deep water circulation? I, as far as I understood, the, the floaters you, you've shown to us, the pictures, they, they float on the surface of the ocean, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, but but they, don't, they don't measure deep water. So they, they, they measure surface uh, turbulence, but how well and at what resolution can we measure the velocity of water at depth and, and, and how is that done? Mm. Or did I miss that part? You, uh, no, uh, I haven't really gone into that. But one thing is those Argo floats, uh, they, they, they are ballasted for 1,000 meters depth. Okay. So they drift for 10 days. And between each surfacing points, then you get an 
Over 10 days, you get an estimate of the mean ocean current at 1,000 meters. So that's, I don't know if that's deep enough for you, but that gives a good in <laughs> indication of the deep circulation. And they are all over the uh, world ocean, um, so they provide good data. Other than that, we have um, more the instruments. We identify some gateways, some important regions where exchange occurs, where important circulations happen. Then we deploy moorings. These are bottom anchored lines uh, to which we attach different instruments to me measure the ocean currents. They can profile the ocean currents and we get good insight onto the volume transport rates mm -hmm. and the currents from those. There's been global programs, international collaborations to capture those at different gateways. So, so, so can, we, can we detect whether the Northern Atlantic thermal highland circulation is slowing down or not? Hmm. <laughs> May I add on that and um, ask you if the, the titles that we sometimes see in the media of this heat conveyor belt that would stop mm -hmm. is, is pure hype from the media or is it something that could happen? Yeah, there are many answers to that. So uh, it won't stop. I can assure you, uh, yeah, it won't stop. If you look at, for example, the IPCC report, they would claim with uh, relatively high confidence that uh, there may be some slowing down, but it won't, it won't st there's no data suggesting that. Um, so we measure, actually, since 2004, I think, we measured the uh, uh, meridional overturning circulation, Atlantic part of that, at the array called rapid array. Uh, all the way from the Florida Strait to the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. So that covers the entire circulation at that latitude, 26 degrees north. So with that, we can actually look at the data available, I think 14 years or so, so far. Um, it doesn't show a significant trend of slowing down. It shows a hint of slowing down. So th th there's some suggestion of some reduction in the strength of the overturning circulation. But uh, it's not highly confident yet. Uh, of our um, backyard in Norway, we've been maintaining um, an array looking at the strength of the Gulf Stream, our version of the Gulf Stream, for 25 years. That hasn't shown any indications of uh, reduction in strength. So, the, we, we are not there yet in terms of length of observations to make any conclusions. Are there questions in the, in the room? Yes, there is one. Please, the microphone. Um, thank you so much for your very interesting uh, conference. You were talking about uh, the density of the water and I did not understand correctly uh, this term. Is it uh, connected with the, the, the heat? I mean, cold water is more dense than wa warm water. Is that what you meant or something else? Yeah, uh, good question. Sorry, I, I was not clear on many, many technical details. So the ocean density, it's dependent on temperature, salinity, and the pressure. Higher temperature is lighter water. Higher salinity is denser water. That's why if you freeze sea ice, you eject salt, so that becomes dense, so it will sink. Or at high latitudes, if you lose heat to atmosphere, you cool the surface, that will be colder, denser, it will sink. And also it increases with pressure, but that's not dynamically important. We remove that effect. There's an, another question right at the top there. Oui, bonsoir. J'avais une question sur la salinité de l'eau. Est-ce que ça, ça a une importance sur les mers, sur les poissons, sur, sur nous, je ne sais pas. Est-ce qu'en augmentant la température, ça augmente la salinité Thank you, that's a good question. It's a, it's a complicated one, but I don't think you want to go there. That's something we, uh, something we call spice in the ocean. The temperature and salinity is spicy ocean. It's that you can have the same density, um, you can increase the temperature, reduce the salinity, then you can end up at the same density or vice versa. 
So some changes in temperature can be compensated by changes in salinity, and that has consequences for how the waters are then uh, distributed and circulated. But uh, per se, a change in temperature does not translate to anything uh, like one-to-one -one linked to salinity changes. So, but there may be regions and times that, they, that may occur, but that's a different process. So there are two different things normally. And for the, that, that was the it. question, that About was the, it? the salinity. Is there another, yeah, there's one here. Mike's coming. It's uh, linked to the same question uh, with the increasing of the pollution of the oceans with microplastics and uh, wastewater and different waters we, we send and the increase in the oceans. What, how can you imagine the impact of the currents uh, and maybe the, the chemistry of the oceans? Yeah. So that, that's a good one too. Thank you. So of course, uh, turbulence is very important for the uh, distribution of uh, microplastics in the ocean, but also the mean circulation patterns, the eddies, maybe all the scales and their interactions, like I tried to uh, motivate you in the beginning, that their interactions uh, must be understood properly to, to sufficiently model the distribution of the microplastics. Uh, I think my colleagues are doing um, modeling studies. It's very difficult to measure microplastic concentration, so you have to rely on the distribution from model fields. So they can come a good way to track where the different uh, concentrations are going. But my understanding is that turbulent mixing is of huge importance for the whole process. I hope the technology comes where we can measure uh, micro plastic concentration properly. I'm not into that literature, but I don't think it's very practical yet. Maybe Kim, you want to? Comment on that? Yeah, I mean, as far as the microplastic issue, um, I've been, I look, and also the wastewater is hugely important in coastal regions, especially. Um, and people are, we are looking at this right now, especially, but more from the standpoint of the aerosolization. But from the micro, microplastics, it does seem like the currents will, like, that's how you get con concentrated in the gyres and that kind of thing. But they are getting better um, at, at, if you collect the water, you can stain and count microplastics now. Um, it's getting much, much better. But in the air, we're still trying to figure out whether they're important. Is there another question in the room? Otherwise, I, I do have one actually. Uh, <clears throat> it's not similar, but in, talking about pollution, about microplastics. Um, it's about protection of the oceans, right? So I would like to take you on a, another level, also related to, to this UN decade of, uh, of the oceans. Uh, the topic obviously belongs to the so-called science of the commons, the commons being that, the, the things that belong to no one or everybody, or humanity, if we can say that. Um, an article in the science, uh, science, uh, scientific literature uh, last month um, proposed to, cons to consider the, the oceans as a living entity by itself and to protect this as a living entity. Uh, so in terms of governance, in terms of protection, what is you, your view on what needs to be done and, and by whom? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So you know what, the marine protected areas, such a low percentage of the global ocean coverage, it's a very small percentage. I don't know the number, but the experience is that uh, each time they protect an area, it uh, flourishes. It's, uh, the, the species grow, it's uh, a healthy environment, not only for the ecosystem in there, but also for humans around. So I totally agree. Uh, we have to increase the area of marine protected areas so that we are not there yet. And there's good experience that uh, when we do that, we, things change. So. I think that can only be done at a political level. So different nations have to act on the political side. Do we have the right governance tool to, 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 to do that? I don't know if some of you want to comment, if you, Kim? No, I'm just, I'm thinking like from the ocean perspective, who, who is responsible, you know, it's always who, who's responsible, who, who owns it, who cares, you know, how can you, who is, who is, 
Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I, it is a tough one. I mean, air quality, I can answer. The air quality is like the state above which it exists in the federal government and the different governments. But oceans, it's like people always seem to point at it being someone else, a lot of times someone else's problem, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, uh, each country has a very limited uh, part of the ocean. Um, a certain nautical miles is their economic zone that they, can, uh, they rule over. So otherwise than the international law of uh, the seas that rule, and so it's very difficult to make decisions that hold all over the place because there are so many voices. And so it's not well um, governed, mm -hmm. I think. So there's some uh, action to be done. Yeah, yeah. you mentioned the law of the sea, which exists. And I, I, as far as I, I know, this is a legal framework that, that, that rules like shipment and where are you allowed to fish her and which part of the shelf area belongs to country and these things, mm -hmm. and maybe even a bit of deep sea mining. But if, if we want to do like these new uh, methods that we've spoken about in the first talk about like this geoengineering thing where even the ocean, like putting, putting alkalinity into the oceans or, or micronutrients to, to, to sequester CO2 or other things we want to do with the oceans, there's absolutely no legal framework under which one can do this. Which, which, which is a huge problem because the question is who's allowed to do this, who has the responsibility if something goes wrong, who has the benefit, who pays. And, and, and so, so the, the oceans are, are not, not legally ruled. So even if it would be technically possible, legally it would not be possible. It's a big, big problem. And the, uh, the, the way the, the big of the countries in the world are set up at the moment, as we all know, it it's, doesn't look as if such a framework will come about very soon. Nick, about this idea of uh, living, considering the oceans as a living and your, your entity, you're a life I mean, expert and you like fluxes? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's words, I would say. I mean, the oceans are enormously precious, whether you want to call them living or not living. Um, I don't think it makes any difference to me, personally. Um, the, the thing is, I mean, we're back to governance. And, and, and I just, you know, this is where I really do despair because I, I, I don't know what we do. It's obvious that we have to form some, some functional, effective global governance, not just for the oceans, but for pretty much everything that's going wrong. And we need to do it now. Um, and, and there just doesn't seem to be a political way of making it happen. So I think scientifically, we can solve many of these problems. It's just that politically, it seems so far away. And yet, at the same time, the reason that I have some optimism is that I sense that the majority of people, and a very strong majority of young people, feel very strongly about these issues and are politically more active, not necessarily in terms of voting, but in terms of activism. I hope voting too. But I, I, I think that there, there needs to be a worldwide movement of people who care. Uh, and that's the only source of real optimism that I have because I, I think we are globally, the young especially, beginning to talk a common language, beginning to recognize that this is a global threat. Uh, and, and, and that, you know, I think for it to work, we're talking about. I hesitate to use the word revolution, but we really have to overturn a lot of the way that the current systems are working. That's not an anti-capitalist diatribe or anything. It's simply that the way it works now is not compatible with a long-term future for humanity. Uh, and we urgently need to, to, to fix global governance in a way that works for the majority of people. That could be the conclusion, unless you want to add something, no? That's for sure. If there is no, there is one last question there. I'll take it and then we'll close the evening. I have two questions, two small questions. So as regards uh, uh, what was said, I heard that some people propose to humanize nature uh, for it to be better protected. So maybe that could be a solution. And uh, my second question relates to the volcanoes, and in particular, submarine volcanoes. Would it be possible for a submarine volcano to 
So, uh, on, a, on a déjà rép répondu quelque part à la, la question des volcans et de leur impact tout à l'heure. Donc, um, on the first part of the question, so really considering uh, oceans like a living entity, it's not really giving names or human uh, uh, names, but really considering uh, the, the ocean as a living entity. Uh, you want to react to what, what maybe Nick said, and that could be the conclusion of the evening, uh, Ilke. Yeah, I, I mean, in, in a way, I agree with Nick that it doesn't matter if it's living or not. It's very important. It's uh, hugely important for the climate system, for the humans. It provides us everything we need. But I see the I see the benefit of thinking as a, like a, it's it's more fragile as living. Uh, maybe there's a merit to it that uh, we can protect it better if we agree that it's a living ecosystem, which it is actually. But yeah, I'd like to think it that way. So let's keep it alive. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, do you want to add something? Yeah, please do. Uh, Last well, I, I mean, I suppose the, the idea of Gaia is something that goes back much yeah. further, and it's something that a lot of people have sympathy with the idea, even if I, I don't think the planet is living yeah. as such, but, but, but Gaia is a very Go. pleasing idea, and I, I, the oceans fit into that context. Yeah. Just, just one other final point, if I may. Um, in terms of use of words or definitions, um, we really... You know, there the, are the various people have tr have tried to put value on things, and this is slightly linked. Putting call it, calling the ocean living is putting some kind of valuation on it, uh, and a serious problem with economics at the moment is that it doesn't value um, the resources of the planet, um, and, and that includes biodiversity and so on. It includes the rainforests and everything else. And until we, it's painful for a lot of people to commoditize nature. Um, but at the moment, economics is working in the opposite, is pulling in the opposite direction, and, and, and we need to find a way of, of valuing things in a way that makes sense. I think that's a nice conclusion. A big round of applause for Ilke Fer and the uh, guests tonight. <laughs> voilà. I have uh, three uh, pieces of information to, to give to you. Tomorrow we'll hear um, Kimberly Prather talk about aerosols. Uh, every day we have animations outside the room before the colloquium before, between 5.30 and 6.30 by the team of uh, the University of Geneva. And the uh, last thing I wanted to say relates to the uh, show that takes place at the Musée d'Arrêt d'Histoire three times, 6.30, 7.30, and 8.30. It lasts for 20 minutes. Apparently, it's uh, fantastic. I haven't had the opportunity to see it yet, but please go. I would like to wish you a lovely evening, and I'll meet you tomorrow. Thank you.